welcome everyone. We'll give it a few moments for folks to get settled in. We're so glad you're all here today. Okay, so I think um, I think it, I think we're good to get started. There's a lot of folks here already. Um, so as you can see, you might see in the chat, there's a message from Brittany. Um, this is recorded because it is put on YouTube. So um, if you want to put questions through the chat or save them until the end, and we'll stop recording and then do question and answer, so that that part isn't on um, on YouTube. Uh, welcome, we're so glad to have you here. Um, I'm Michelle with Family Violence Project, and do you want to introduce yourself, Angela? Yeah, sure. Um, my name's Angela Hamlin. I'm a senior staff attorney at Legal Services for the Elderly. I cover Kennebec County, but the, generally the state now that we work remotely anywhere. Um, I love my organization. I'm glad to tell you a little bit about today. Thank you to Michelle for inviting me. Yeah, thank you. And um, for folks who have done, done this before, even if you haven't, I always try to give a disclaimer. We know that when we talk about um, different aspects of domestic violence and abuse of older adults and abuse of disabilities that we're doing today, it can bring up a lot of things. So please do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself and know that our helpline is available 24 hours a day. People can call anytime to ask questions, get support, even if it's about something that happened in the past or something you're worried about happening right now, you know, know that we're here anytime of day to talk about those things. So um, where these things can bring bring up a lot of emotions, you know, adding in that self-care to your routine today can be really helpful. Um, and so I will hand it over to you to begin with, Angela, I'll switch the slide. And yeah, you can go ahead and start. Great. Thank you, Michelle. So first, we'll just start off um, talking about the many different types of abuse um, that you can encounter um, as an older person. And so there's a nice little list here, bullet points. There's physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual, sexual, neglect, and abandonment. Um, and I think, you know, certain ones come to mind for me uh, that are a little bit more uh, than uh, others. And I don't know where financial would fall in there. I'm, well, I know we're going to be talking about that, but that's certainly one of the main things I encounter. But usually there's overlap within these, I believe. So um, that's just, there's different ones. The spiritual one is interesting and uh, for the older people. And I just, this is a little, just sort of to get your mind thinking about all the different types. Okay. And I'll say we, you know, the reason why this is lumped together, abuse of um, older adults and people with disabilities, that often the, um, you know, the tactics are very similar. The vulnerabilities are very similar uh, between these two groups of people. So, um, you know, when we talk about the power and control wheel, is our next slide, you know, looking at all of the different ways that this can manifest. Um, and it is very similar, unfortunately, like as you add on vulnerabilities, the ways that people can take advantage are amplified. Um, you know, as you've probably heard me say in an earlier presentation, you know, in the hands of an abuser, anything can be a weapon. So anything that, um, you know, increases barriers for, for someone like having an aid, you know, if they need a hearing aid, that abuser could smash that hearing aid. And now it's really hard to communicate with the outside world. Um, if they need a walker, putting that walker in the middle of the room, that may keep them from going anywhere. Um, so unfortunately, when people have different things going on or need different aids or different supports, those things can be used against them and used as a form of that abuse. And certainly financial, I don't know how that was on that list. That was an oversight, clearly. We know that the financial abuse that happens is really, really huge. That's part of the exploitation here of um, on this wheel. You know, when we talk about domestic abuse, it's always, you know, we're talking about this in the power and control. And this wheel is something that we use for, you know, when we're talking about it as you know basic domestic violence but for each group of people there are different things that can be used so this is the one for um, older adults as well as folks with disabilities um, it's more complicated too because or it's i mean i guess it's complicated it's, it's always complicated but um often the person who's being abusive is the caregiver um and that is often a family member it could be you know the only person they're in contact with um the isolation that comes with having a disability being a 
a person with a disability or being older, that isolation, social isolation really increases risk for folks. Um, and it increases, you know, if that's their child that, that they raised who's now being abusive to them, um, that can be complicated too, because, you know, they often don't want to get that person in trouble. They just want them to, you know, not be doing these things, uh, but they don't want them to be in trouble. So that can make it really complicated also. Um, using family, you know, unfortunately, a family can be turned against each other uh, really easily, especially as people get older, especially when there's money involved and it can be hard to know who to believe. So we hear of this happening a lot where there are lots of disagreements and that increases the isolation that people feel. Um, the exploitation around financial, I know Angela will be talking about that. Um, emotional abuse, you know, that I think we, we minimize in our society how impactful that emotional abuse is for folks. Um, you know, when someone is tearing the other person down emotionally, it really um, makes them feel like they can't reach out to. They may be telling them like, no one's gonna believe you. No one's gonna, you know, do this. You're not worth it. All of these things. And unfortunately people um, may internalize that and believe that person who's using abuse. The isolation, you know, we've talked about this main is, so geographically isolated already. And especially when we think about winter, um, when we add on that this may be their sole caregiver or the sole person who's supporting them, um, that really increases um, the risk and also the danger for them. Because it may be really scary that this is happening, but what's the alternative? You know, people may not want to go to, you know, a care facility. They may be scared of, you know, then I won't see any family members. You know, there may be lots of different pieces. Um, you know, neglect, unfortunately when you're dependent on a caregiver the neglect that can happen can come in many different forms emotional you know um not having any emotional support not having any physical supports um not being cleaned properly or regularly and and that can increase barriers too because they may not want to call someone in um depending on the state they're in because of what's going on um and just having those dependencies really increases risks and then any mental capacity um issues that people are having people may not believe them when we think of dementia um that can people are extra vulnerable if they have dementia or any intellectual disability because someone can take advantage of that and say, no one's going to believe you. And unfortunately that happens sometimes because we may see, be like, oh, you know, that can't be happening. They're in a care facility. You know, there are things in place. Um, they're, they're just, you know, they're not with it, which is really awful when people are reporting things and we aren't believing them because of those um, um, intellectual deficits that are happening because of dementia or other things. Um, and then threats, you know, we know that when people are making threats and going through them, you know, that is having a huge impact on people and may keep them from reporting because they know if I report X, Y, or Z is going to happen. Um, and then sexual abuse. I think we often want to think this isn't happening even to older adults, but we know it's happening all the time, unfortunately. So when we hear, and that can be extra hard for people to talk about. Um, so being able to provide space and listening and believing when people do bring it up. Um, is there anything you want to add, Angela, to this? Um, not other than just, you know, it can be, you might just see one of these, but there might be other ones kind of like an iceberg. You only see a little piece of whatever you're seeing. So just, it is a good idea to look at them all over. Um, if you do encounter somebody like you might be seeing them for neglect or exploitation, then just see the other things. I, um, I also think it's, you know, not, not every single older person has a disability, but a lot of them do. And not every single um, disabled person, you know, is vulnerable, but these are just things that make them more vulnerable. So it's important that we kind of meet them where they're at to help them. And I, yeah, I think this is a great wheel. I plan to use it in the future. Thanks, Angela. And great point. Like, don't, we don't want to make assumptions about people's capabilities either. Yep. That's huge. And so some physical signs, you know, I really appreciate these images from um, NCEA and there's a great visual that we can put to as a, um, uh, to share with people because they have lots of things that, you know, it, it's just good to pay attention to these things because we may um, be seeing things and it's like a little piece of the puzzle. And so just keeping an eye out when you're seeing, you know, one of these things, you know, maybe the person just doesn't have an appetite because of a new medication, but maybe something else is going on, right? So we may see things and being able to put it all together um, could be huge. Maybe the glasses are crushed. Maybe that was an accident. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it's keeping someone 
from being able to, you know, read and communicate or read what their rights are or read, you know, changes that were made to their will that they did not actually make. Um, so just being able to pay attention when you see things or are hearing that things are happening, like what's, what's the bigger picture that's going on? Um, so these are some, you know, physical signs. There's also behavioral signs. Um, the isolation being such a huge one. Um, I just always am thinking of that, like having, and this is where like when we think of prevention too, having multiple people in people's lives. So like being connected to lots of different services can really help. Like, so the person going to like Spectrum Generations, the person um, being connected with, you know, the search program with different programs to help keep that isolation so that if something happens, people are noticing like oh hey you know we haven't seen this person in a while or the last time I saw them they were really down and you know being able to rally around someone can be really huge um, because you know you may see these things um, you know here or there but if you're able to work in a team it can be really huge um, yeah that withdrawal from normal activities is a really big one too um, yeah all of these things can be really you know just things to pay attention to and ask about if you see and then the financial signs you know unpaid bills fraudulent signatures um, unusual or sudden uh, changes in spending patterns you know we talk we try to talk to banks about these too and support them in understanding um, what to do when they're seeing these things as well because that can be a place um, where an intervention can happen. I so appreciate how like at Walmart now, if people are buying gift cards, they have to ask like, are you buying this because of something that happened on the phone? Because we hear of those scams a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, these signs actually, if you think about it, make it harder sometimes for the average person to see, especially like the emotional ones, the fact that people end up becoming more depressed and withdrawn makes it even more important for you to sort of spot them so that, you know, or it's going to get worse. And, you know, uh, it's kind of unique like that, I think. And then, so when we're working with folks who um, are experiencing, working with older adults or people with disabilities who who we find out or realize are, are experiencing abuse, you know, acknowledging that fear of the unknown. They may be really scared to move forward because of not wanting to be sent to a group home or to a care facility. And that that fear is real and that fear, um, you know, is valid. It's totally valid. And, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. We, we may want to say like, oh, we'll find other caregivers or we can find other ways. But we don't know what's going to happen. So we can't say that it's all going to be okay because we don't know, but we can sit beside them and talk about, you know, you deserve to be safe right now. Like, you know, what, what can we do to help, um, you know, providing choice whenever possible so that they can feel in control of the situation. Um, that's really huge. And, um, you know, again, that caregiver may be their only source of support um, or their only connection to their family or to other things. So, knowing how scary, how much more scary that can be for folks um, and use their language. Like I think I've said abuser here and there that probably isn't the language that other people are gonna present with. So just using, if they're referring to their son or daughter or child, you know, using that person's name and not abuser because that can feel really scary. Um, you know, that really, you know, it's still their child. They still love them. Um, you know, that could shut down if we, if we use different language than what they're using. Um, and it's okay to, you know, share with them what your concerns are and see what they want to have happen. Um, yeah, we want to support their choice and we want to be transparent so that they can still trust us. Even if we do, you know, I think a lot of us are mandated reporters, even if we do have to make a report just so they know, like, this is what we're doing. These are the resources that are there. This is what it could look like. You know, how, how do you want this to happen? How can I support you in this? So that they can still have choice and still understand what's happening. And then so local resources, you know, we're a local resource, Family Violence Project, um, Legal Services for the Elderly. Um, Angela will tell you all about everything they do. Um, the Office of Aging and Disability, they have a lot of services uh, that they can offer folks. Um, and in and a new service I just learned about too with the Bone on the Bottom, Martha's Cottage and Elder Abuse Institute, they actually will help people in making reports and talk about like um, how those reports can be made and they can provide additional support when a report is made sometimes, which is a really special thing. Um, the long-term care ombudsman, if someone is receiving care services, whether it's in a facility or through their home by with a caregiver, um, that is a place that people can report if something's happening. Um, they are a great support for the community. Um, there are also local task forces, you know, it, 
um, in Somerset County. We have the um, Somerset Community Area Resource Providers, which used to have a senior strong element, but a lot of those same people are still part of that group. So knowing what the resources are, that can be a great place to go. And in Augusta, we have the Augusta Elder Abuse Task Force that meets regularly on their aging in place groups. A lot of towns are starting to have these to support people to be able to live in town, um, live on their own for as long as possible. You know, they'll provide sand for, you know, the driveways and the steps and, you know, support people with different resources like that. Spectrum Generations has a lot, the search programs. And then um, for folks who are differently able, their skills, Assistance Plus, Bridges of Maine, OHI, Pine Tree Society, Goodwill, Uplift, there are a lot of different places that are working really hard to support folks. And then this one at the bottom that I mentioned, Martha's Cottage is um, for, for older adults who are experiencing domestic violence. They actually have um, some places, it's mostly in Southern Maine, but um, they have some shelters that folks can go to, which is really nice too, because uh, domestic violence shelters, it's great that they exist, but they can sometimes have like a lot of kids there, a lot of different things where that could be really stressful to an older adult. So it's nice to have other options as well. And then I'll hand it over to Angela to talk about legal services for the elderly. Absolutely. Um, so I'm not sure how familiar you are with us, but I'm hoping you at least have heard of us. And we're basically um, a free civil uh, legal organization that helps anyone in the state of Maine ages 60 and up. Um, we are um, mandated, you know, we're, we're meant to help socially and economically needy Mainers over age 60, as the slide says. Um, we have very wide parameters, though. That means, like, some organizations, um, like our sister organizations, will have funding um, restrictions. We don't really have that in the sense of, like, if a case is, like, you know, they have too much income or every single case will get screened. So that's always remember to refer people to us. They might not have qualified for other legal aid before, but certainly um, we try to cast a broad net, certainly, uh, especially for anyone suffering from abuse. Head to the next slide for me, Michelle. Okay, and then so a little bit more about our programs is we um, have helpline attorneys. We actually have like four or five now. We just hired another one whose job is just to give legal advice on the phone all day long. You know, those older people love the phone and or people who have a hard time getting out of the house or just getting around. Generally, the phone is a good resource. Uh, and they will get same day uh, talking with a paralegal. And if it's a um, case that requires action, they will hear from an attorney that day. Um, and then we also have area office attorneys, and that'd be someone like me, uh, who is sort of like a field person. We go to court, we go to meet our clients in person, we do the more in-person stuff. And then we also have a whole section of people that are just dedicated to helping people with Medicare. And that actually includes younger disabled people as well. As long as they have Medicare, they can get that free assistance. And that would be assistance with different drug, you know, getting coverage or um, different plans. They're really knowledgeable and Again, free, so that's nice. Next slide, please. Okay, oh, and it talks a little bit more here. So helpline attorneys, they advise on a broad range of civil legal matters. Um, and just so you know, civil is like basically everything but criminal. So um, it includes, you know, wills and uh, protection orders and, you know, anything else, um, but nothing criminal. And then it says here, you know, either they refer to us or we actually do have um, lawyers who agree to be on our referral panel if it's something that we um, don't have um, enough resources for at the moment. And then, so here's a good example of stuff that we, the help fund attorneys do, consumer debt, lots of questions about credit card debt and different debts. And um, I love being able to tell my clients that they will never go to prison for debt. Um, then housing, elder abuse, exploitation, public benefits, social security issues, power of attorney issues, things of that sort. Um, definitely all within our wheelhouse. Next slide, please. And well, can I ask you a question, Angela? <laughs> I'm of course. Interrupt your flow. Yeah. Just because I know you shared in the past about how, um, you know, with helping someone who is experiencing elder abuse. And again, you know, we've talked about how they may not want to get their child in trouble, but you all, I think are so graceful with inter intervening in a way that's like, you know, this, even just the prospect of having a lawyer who can help and say like, hey, you, you know, this isn't okay, can be enough to like make that person back off. Do you want to speak a little about that? Is that okay? Yeah, of course, sure. So I, um, you know, 
completely understand my client's concerns with, you know, not wanting to alienate family. We work really hard. We understand that even if it is a family member exploiting them, that they don't want them to get into a jail, for example, usually, even though it might be a crime what they're doing. And that's why I love my job because I get to sort of present my client with their options and they're everything from mediation or just a conversation or here are some civil protections um, just to get you, you know, so that it stops happening. Um, I We're all about creative solutions for sure. So it, it we can take the whole element of the criminal aspect out of it because unlike, you know, most people, we aren't mandated reporters. So my client tells me, you know, they don't want to do anything. They don't want to report this. Then I don't, you know, then we don't, we, we sort of um, listen to what they're saying to us. And hopefully, uh, you know, our theory is that if they're not ready, then they'll be ready, you know, when it's, when it's time for them. And I have had many times where I close a case and they call me a year later and say, listen, I'm ready now to sort of try to recover this money or I'm, I'm ready now to do something about this. And it, it gives them the power back. So it's, again, it's about um, enforcing their choices and helping them to make educated choices and um, realize that it's sometimes they just don't make those choices because they don't know what's available to them. And that's, you know, why we're here today, hopefully to tell everybody more about what's available to people. Thank you so much, Angela. So area office attorneys, that'd be like me. And um, so we do a wide range um, for brief services to extend representation. So that's like full on representation in court. We might do something brief, like calling a landlord um, just to tell the landlord, hey, like, you know, that's not safe housing. And sometimes that's enough. As you sort of mentioned, sometimes it's scary, like a you know letter or a phone call, just reminding somebody that they're, what they're doing is wrong. will get them to you know, do what's right. Then sometimes it takes an extended representation, which, you know, is sort of filing a court case or, uh, you know, showing up and making those arguments to a judge who will then order the change. So it is a wide variety. It keeps us busy. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so more of our case types, just because I'm trying to get your little gears thinking about what kind of cases we take. It's literally everything, but um, evictions. So eviction defense. Um, Sometimes this will include also affirmative evictions, which might mean like somebody moves in with an elder um, and they're not contributing and then the elder's housing is going to be at risk or something we will then evict if we need to. Um, and so that's, that does kind of put us in a different realm because most people can't afford an attorney to help them evict. It's very expensive. So um, we do do foreclosure defense, um, financial exploitation is a big one. So we can bring lawsuits to try to recover assets. Um, protection from abuse, protection from harassment, do those a lot. Um, any sort of public benefit appeal, which includes, you know, SNAP or heating assistance, um, any sort of federal program or state program. And then discharges from nursing homes or assisted living facilities, or um, again, appealing maybe somebody's reduction um, in hours at home if they're disabled is getting cut. We do appeals for that. Um, powers of attorney. Um, so we do do those as, on occasion as well. And there's some other things too, I'm sure, but that's a just sort of a list. And then legal checkups is our new thing that, you know, we're very interested in prevention. Um, it's hard to prevent elder abuse though, or, you know, abuse of vulnerable people. But one way is to do um, what's called legal checkup. And basically, you know, uh, certain callers when they call in and they might get their question answered and it says here over 70 or they are recently a lost a spouse or recently hospitalized. Also, anyone can just ask for one of these, by the way, but we'll offer them um, to have a legal checkup. And it's similar to like a physical exam where we kind of like go through this whole list of things, that, common things that happen to older people um, and see if they have a plan or they thought about it or just it's kind of looking for those red flags it's more in depth but it's definitely a new thing we're doing and I, every single legal checkup i've done has resulted in me helping with something else so it just goes to show you there's a lot of need out there next slide please oh, okay and then so the medicare health here um medicare is very confusing if um you're not familiar with it there's like 26 different part d plans that's prescription drug coverage and here you have um, a list of what we have available and we do have we have the best of the best for Medicare specialists and appeals for that. So um, again, this is it reminds you that it's 
for anyone on Medicare, even if they're under age 60. So, And these are the kind of cases we do not handle. Um, so situations where basic needs are not at stake, um, that's true. So, but usually most of the case of somebody's being abused, that is, will circumvent this. So sometimes, um, but like if somebody's hunky dory and they just got a lot of money and they want to know how to save it, um, that we make a referral for that. Um, we don't do criminal defense. We don't do family law, but that's a little deceiving because we basically just don't do divorces. Um, although we're we might be branching into that. Um, bankruptcy, that's a very specialized field, so we'll make referrals on that. And then small claims, um, we actually that's not a hard no, but that's mostly what we'll do is advise people because most people go to small claims on their own. Um, it, but depending on the situation, that's for cases under six thousand dollars in case you're not sure. Um yeah, and then we always are trying to meet our client's goal. Um, and sometimes somebody's goal might be like revenge, then we're not going to be able to help them there. But as long as their goal is something, um, you know, that we can help with, we will help. And okay, these are the referrals on places you could go if for some reason that um, we weren't able to help you. And, you know, um, I think we kind of already talked about those. So we'll skip that slide. Here's how you reach us, Helpline. Um, it is open every single day, Monday through Friday from eight to noon, and then there's an hour break, and then one to four. Um, they will speak with our paralegal that day. Um, also, if for some reason they call and there's a somebody already on the line, it'll tell you the approximate wait time, which is great. And it's never longer than like, I'm pretty sure, I haven't been told otherwise, but eight or nine minutes, I've never heard it longer than that. Um, but usually you get right through. Um, and then our website's really great as well. So check that out if you haven't yet. And then our services, which we've gone over in the past webinars, but I'll just, or I'll just say again, our 24 hour helpline is, you know, people can call us anytime to ask questions, get support, um, help with safety planning. Uh, we have emergency shelter in Kennebec and Somerset. We also have court advocates, but if people are older, we often do refer to legal services for the elderly because we are not lawyers here. You know, we can support people through that process, um, but having a lawyer can be really helpful too. So, um, and we have a liaison to CPS. So if someone does have children and CPS is involved because of domestic violence, we can uh, support them with navigating that as well as individual advocacy support groups and also domestic violence intervention classes. Um, and then, so do folks, I don't know if we want to stop the recording and then um, if folks have any questions and I'll also put in the chat, the evaluation, um, but yeah, can you stop recording?